Hey, Fight Fans, Cage Minds doing our UFC 143 prediction show. To any fighter that I mess up his name or miscorrectly pronounce it, I apologize now. I'm sorry. No intent on trying to offend anyone. 11 predictions on this fight card. Hopefully we'll have 11 fights on fight night. Be the first time in a while that all of the announced bouts were actually able to take to happen. So, we'll get right to it. The first fight, Rafael Sapo Natal, who's 13-3-1, will take on the debuting Michael Kumper, who's 11-0. Natal, a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu specialist, who's really worked to improve his striking game with Phil Nurse, who's also trained Frankie Edgar in GSP. We saw in his last fight versus Paul Bradley, he has an improved wrestling game. He was able to use good sprawls and just throw the stronger wrestler off of him not wanting to play with that game, not trying to be underneath and get ground and pounded. Michael Kumper, who it is his debut, is a black belt in judo, a blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and has a powerful right hand. I've yet to seen a lot of kicking out of his striking game, I've seen some devastating knees, and in the clinch. Natal probably has a disadvantage when it comes to the clinch, doesn't want to get in close, wants to use the same kind of strategy he used against Paul Bradley. Use the kicks, keep it away. I could see him having an advantage if he gets this fight to the ground that isn't tall. A palm crumpler if he's in the top position. But the judo guy has such good core strength that I'm not sure if that would even be something he wants to play with. I see Natal being able to win this fight by outstriking, outpointing, using his lethal leg kicks, and taking this in a unanimous decision with a 29-28 score, I think will be the judges. That's our first projection. Unanimous decision for Rafael Natal. Second fight now, Dan Sitton, who's seven and one, taking on Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, who's five and zero. Oh. Sitton is the anvil. He comes from a grappling background. He's going to come in this fight, be aggressive, put the pressure, take this to the ground, use the ground and pound to soften up his opponent, and then sink in a submission when he sees a weak moment. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is a phenomenal kickboxer. A hundred and three and zero between amateur and professional kickboxing bouts. 40 knockouts over countless amounts of titles and tournaments won. He's also been a secret part, a secret training weapon partner of George Rush St. Pierre. So I'm sure he's had extensive opportunities to train the grappling to work on his takedown defense. If the Wonder Boy is really that wonderful and he's able to withstand the early onslaught of Sitton, that's the first minute as he comes out and tries to put pressure, lands an uppercut, maybe a knee. I think that we see a first round TKO just from the more well rounded striker. He seems to be comfortable and has had more ways to win throughout his mixed martial arts career, even pulling out a submission. So when you got the ground and the stand up working together at such a high level, I think we'll see Thompson with a tremendous debut, first round TKO. It'll be in spectacular fashion. Next fight, we're talking about Matthew Immortal Brown, who's 14 and 11, taking on Chris C. Murder Cope, who's 5 and 3. Immortal Brown has a reach advantage and an experience advantage, and without even thinking about it, he has a huge advantage in the submission game. Chris Cope from a season on Ultimate Fighter, we knew that was what everyone tried to do, take him to the ground. He showed improvements on his takedown defense. After the show, he showed improvements greatly on his striking ability. Brown has very good striking. He was able to out outstrike John Howard, who I have tremendous amount of respect for his striking abilities. So Matt Brown can put it all together. He has the more composure. He's been in the position coming off of loss with his back against the fence before. I don't know how Chris Cope's going to rebound off of this. And like we said, it's up to him to try to get inside, which he really wasn't able to do against Chi Mills, who also had a reach advantage of him. I can see this fight being striking for the first two rounds. At some point, if Brown just doesn't feel he's finishing it, wants to really assert himself, I see him taking this to the ground and ending it with an arm bar in the third round, finishing it off because he has such a dynamic advantage when it comes to the submission game. Next fight, we're talking about Alex Bruce Leroy Karasis, who's 6-4. and four taking on Edwin Figueroa, who's 8-1. and one. This is going to be a great bantamweight battle. For Alex Karasis, I think his record's a little misconstrued as he fought at 45 and at 55, fighting much bigger guys that were able to ground and pound him and put him in disadvantageous positions. Now at 35, I think he's found his home. We've seen his unorthodox and dynamic striking techniques that'll throw out from everywhere. Edwin Figueroa, we've primarily seen, even though he comes from a Muay Thai background, I've only seen the two hands. He's thrown a lot of punches, very heavy-handed. His ground and pound is great. But I think that the length, the reach advantage again, 
of Karasis and the advantage that he has from being at the Ultimate Fighter and having taken on stiff competition, I think we see a real kickboxing match here. And again, I'm going to go 29-28 and think that Bruce Leroy takes this fight. From Edwin Figueroa, I just haven't seen enough of his striking game. He really needs to bring the kicks and be able to stop the moment the movement of Alex Karasis. He's had so much speed, and that's what really messed up Escovito, and I'm looking for that to be his advantage. Again, the speed and the length. So we got Eric Alex Karasis winning that fight with a unanimous decision. Next fight we're going to is Matthew Riddle, 5-3, and three, was sick the last time he was supposed to compete, coming back really fast, only a couple events later. He's taking on George Lopez, who's 11-2, and two, little monster, who's the protege of Vanderlei Silva. So he's coming out of that Wanda fight team. Matthew Riddle with those eight career fights. This is going to be his ninth, and all of them are within the UFC. So he's used to the pressure, he's used to the octagon, he's used to the big crowd. He also has a grappling advantage. He has to come in, use the pressure, and take down the fight to the ground, use his ground and pound, and try to beat up Lopez. Lopez has dangerous stand-up, good kicks, and power in his hands. He could end this from the feet. His jiu-jitsu, his takedown defense, it's all somewhat lacking. Hope to see some improvements from the last time out in the octagon when Eddie Edwards was able to rough him up, beat him up, and do exactly what I think Matthew Riddle's going to do. This one's closer in my head than on paper, but I think Matthew Riddle with the size advantage, with the reach advantage, with the wrestling advantage, he's going to use this to take it to the ground, use the ground and pound, and pull off a unanimous decision victory. On the other hand, Mario Lopez could win with a surprising knockout, but I'm going with Matthew Riddle. Next fight we're going to talk about Dustin the Diamond Poye, who is 11-1, takes on Max Little Evil Holloway, who's 4-0. Poye, he's been through several different opponents, finally got one. This is about the third different guy that he's had to train for or expected to fight in this time period leading up to UFC 143. We know he has good hands, a fearless, aggressive style, and ever-growing submissions that he's learning from Tim Crater. Max Holloway, he's from... God's own tribe in Hawaii fighting club, and he has good hands, good head movement, really quick with it. He has long reach. He's six foot one, a really tall, really skinny 145 pounder. Four and zero in his mixed martial arts career. One TKO, three decisions. Seems to be pretty well rounded everywhere, except I give Poye the experience advantage, obviously. Uh, slightly on the striking advantage. I've seen him use more kicks and more techniques. He definitely has a submission advantage. So just everywhere I look, I think that Poye is a little bit better in this fight, and I see him also being able to take the unanimous decision as he's... I don't like guys coming on late notice. He's really ready for this fight. This is going to be a 5-5 winning streak in the UFC, and I think Poye deserves to be the next contender for Jose Aldo in that featherweight division. Now we go up to the main card, I think this is, and we have Ed Short Fuse Herman, who's 19-7, and taking on Clifford Starks, who's 8-0. and Ed Short Fuse Herman, in his last two UFC bouts, has been nothing short of spectacular, ending Tim Crater's night with a big uppercut, and then also heel hooking Kyle Noak. His opponent in this fight, Clifford Starks, is primarily a wrestler. Starks is going to want to take this put to the ground. He's from that Arizona State wrestling background. He's learning very well. He throws big hooks, looking to land shots with power, not the prettiest technique, more throwing punches to set up the takedown. It's easy to say this Herman has the experience, a more technical striking edge, a submission grappling edge, and the only way that we see Ed Herman having a downside in this fight is if he's able to be taken to the ground and if Clifford Starks just uses the ground and pound. I think he goes to the ground early. I think Herman lets it. His experience takes in, and he's able to slap on probably a triangle choke in the first round for a submission victory. We're going with short fuse Ed Herman to continue this winning streak ever since missing all of 2011. 2012 looks to be a good year for him. Now we go on. Next fight on the main card, we have Henan Barrow, who's 29-1, and one, taking on Scott Jorgensen, who's 13-4. and four. Preliminarily, this bout looks like it could be for who will fight the winner of Dominic Cruz, Uriah Faber, down the road to get a away title fight. At least that's the way I feel. Henan Barrow, who's only lost his first MMA fight, 28 straight fights, one draw in that time, and the rest are being victories, or one no contest in that time, excuse me, not a draw. But Henry Barrow has had nothing but victories. Comes from that same camp of Jose Aldo, impeccable takedown defense, 
great leg kicks, is a fight finisher from the submission and from the TKO perspective. And I think what we see happening in this fight is that Scott Jorgensen's going to get on top in the first round. The fire will light, the leg kicks will come, the knees and the elbows, and after that, Burrell will be able to stay off of his back, outstrike and outposition Scott Jorgensen. I think I see Henry Burrell, and I'm going to say this, 2012, he will be the UFC Bantamweight Champion of the World. He's going to win this fight in a unanimous decision victory. Next on the main card, Josh Koscheck, 18-5, taking on Mike Pierce, 13-4. Josh Koscheck seems invigorated again. Mike Pierce had to come out and make some personal comments, had to inspire Josh Koscheck to train for this fight. Koscheck has the experience advantage, the reach advantage, the height advantage, a mixed martial arts wrestling advantage. I feel he's just one of the most spectacular wrestlers that we have in mixed martial arts, making it functional for mixed martial arts. And there's that deadly kosh bomb hand. He has the right hand. He has the power. I see the wrestling of both of these men being nullified. Mike Pierce will score points with leg kicks, but at some point his chin will come open. I say in the second round, the big bat bomb will land from Koscheck. There will be a second round TKO. Not taking anything away from Pierce, but if Pierce wins this fight, it'll be outpointing and getting a unanimous decision, as he does use more kicks than Koscheck. But I don't think his punching and his accuracy are up to the level, and it's just not up to the level with the power. Koscheck will put him to sleep. We're up to the co-main event. Roy Big Country Nelson, 17-6, and six, taking on Fabricio Verdum, who's 14-5-1. and one. This fight is cut right down the middle for me, 50-50. I really struggle back and forth with this one to make my prediction on it. Roy Nelson, we know he has that big knockout power in his right hand. We know he has good clinch and great core strength throughout all of his jiu-jitsu and his wrestling. He can get people in the crucifix, he pounds them out. Not the most devastating of a striker with that ground and pound, but it is effective enough to warrant stoppages. He has a good submission repertoire, so does his opponent for Beast Over Doom. Probably is, thanks to the Abu Dhabi, Abu, Abu Dhabi contest. We know him as the best submission grappling heavyweight in the world. Even probably right now from straight grappling competitions, he's above a Nogueira and above a Mir. But that also changes a lot when we go to MMA about that submission ability because now you're getting punched in the face, not just a straight grappling tournament. Verdum has always been working to improve his striking, but to me it's really just ugly. His takedowns were ineffective against Alistair Overeem. He has great submission capabilities, but neither one of these men, for both of their great submission capabilities, have ever been submitted. Both men have only won fights twice off a decision. So in a very, very, very close fight, I think that Roy Nelson landing that big right hand will be able to hurt his opponent more, maybe even throw some leg kicks, do some of that extra weight to get on top and use some ground and pound. I can see Roy Nelson taking the unanimous decision victory in our co-main event. This leads us up now to the main event. The main event is the welterweight interim title fight between Nick Diaz, 27-7-1, and, and the natural born killer, Carlos Conant, who's 27-5. and five. Diaz Usually he's used to a reach and a height advantage. He's actually going to be two inches shorter in each category than Condon. This is something that makes me feel even better. We know the punches and bunches. The cardio of Nick Diaz, good grappling, impeccable submissions, extraordinary at the grappling and at the transitions. He doesn't use many kicks. He doesn't use many elbows. He primarily stands using his boxing. If Carlos Condon uses movement, uses leg kicks, shoot inside with few knees, he likes to use the elbows, has more power in his hands for the straight knockout ability. I think that we see a back and forth fight. We can see the ground. We're going to see everything in this one. But I feel during the fourth round, we can see a flying knee or a huge right hook. And I see a TKO coming as that Diaz doesn't have the technique that Condon does. Condon just has more powerful technique, technique more timing, more patience. I think this is Carlos Condon's time. It'll spoil GSP's dream of him versus Diaz, but I see the fourth round knockout for Carlos Condon. We're going to go through our predictions one more time. We got Rafael Natal winning with unanimous decision. Steven Wonderboy Thompson with a first round TKO. Matt Brown with the third round armbar. Alex Karasis, we're going with a decision. I'm going split decision for him. Matthew Riddle with a unanimous decision. Dustin Poirier with a unanimous decision. Ed Herman, a first round submission. Hennenberg Rao, I can see a unanimous decision, him overtaking Jorgensen. Josh Koscheck, second round TKO. Roy Nelson, a unanimous decision. And Carlos Condit with a fourth round TKO. These have been the Cage Minds picks 
for UFC 143. Thanks for watching. Uncage the warrior within yourself. Hit us up on Facebook, Twitter. Thanks for watching the videos. Leave us a comment, like the video. Have a good night.